The scripture reading is from the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. This is God's word. Good morning. It's good to be back. It is good to be back. It's good to see you all. It's a joy uh, to be gathered again. Um, you know, the summertime is a time where we usually think about not only just resting, but also doing checkups and taking care of things that we don't normally get a chance to take care of throughout the busyness of our fall and the spring. Today is feels like, to me, more of a spiritual checkup based upon the passage that we just read. If you go to the doctor for your annual checkup, normally the doctor, they'll, you know, shine the light in your eyes to check your eyesight and your vision. They'll take the otoscope, put it in your ear, check your hearing, your hearing. They'll ask you to open up your mouth and say, ah, so they can check your mouth and your throat and make sure all that situation is good. They'll take their, uh, their tool and they'll hit your knee and make sure your reflexes are good. I'm always, every time we get to that part, I'm always like, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move. And then it just, it just happens. I guess it's good that my body still works the way it should. They do all these things, but arguably the most important diagnostic test that they run is when they take their stethoscope, put it on your chest to check your heart. And the idea there is obviously if there's something off or wrong with your heart, it's an indication that there's a deeper issue wrong in your body. Today in Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 27, Solomon is basically telling his son, if there is something wrong in your heart, it's an indication that there's something wrong in your life. So the question, the diagnostic question that you and I have to ask ourselves today is simply this. How's your heart? How is your heart? Jennifer Gardner, the actress and actor Samuel L. Jackson, for probably, I don't know how long now, but for years, they've been, you know, doing these Capital One commercials where they're asking this penetrating question, what's in your wallet? Solomon is asking his own penetrating question, what's in your heart? Is it happy or is it sad? Is it full of joy or is it full of sorrow? Is it full or is it empty? Is it light or is it heavy? How is your heart? Today as we continue on this summer series on intersection, we're talking about the intersection between faith and wisdom. The book of Proverbs tells us all about wisdom and the interesting thing about Proverbs is that it's not trying to make us be wise in certain scenarios and situations. Proverbs isn't particularly concerned with you making a particularly wise decision today. Proverbs is concerned in you becoming the kind of person who consistently, routinely, and regularly always makes wise decisions because you're living in wisdom. And the, when we think about the intersection between faith and wisdom, the key that unlocks our understanding on how these two go together is the heart. Your heart and mine. Which is why main point for today and the only point for today, some of you may be really excited about that. Don't know if that means the sermon is going to be any shorter, but it's the only point for today. Amen. The treasure of your heart will determine the trajectory of your life. The treasure of your heart, what your heart desires, what your heart clings to, what you love, the treasure of your heart will determine the trajectory of your life. Now, that may seem like a really bold claim. So let's look at verse 20 to see if this is true or not. He says, my son, first nine chapters in the book of Proverbs is a father talking to his son. Before, most people, when they think about the Proverbs, they think about the short pithy sayings, that comes a lot later. The first nine chapters, Solomon is talking to his son, and every single stanza begins, my son, my son, pay attention, listen up. 
He says, my son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Here in these eight verses, we're reminded that wisdom is something, a life of wisdom is not something you can give yourself partially to, it's something you must give yourself wholly to and fully to. Wisdom doesn't just want some of you, it wants all of you. If you notice in the eight verses that was read to you, that Solomon here, he names almost every part of the body. He's basically trying to say and connect, running a diagnostic on your body is similar to running a diagnostic on your life. He references the eyes, he references the ears. Later on, he'll reference the feet and where you go. He's not trying to separate yourself into different individual body, body parts, but what he is trying to communicate is that wisdom requires all of who you are. It requires everything. He says to his son, first, pay attention to my, my son. Listen to my words. He's basically saying, hey, listen up. What I'm telling you is very, very important. Or in the words of the Lord Jesus, let those who have ear hear. Then he says that once you are hearing, when you are listening, and listening for the words of wisdom coming from the word of God. Then he says, let them not escape from your sight. He says, your vision, your eyesight can't be clouded, can't be blurry. It has to be set on my word as it reveals my wisdom. Let them not escape your eye. Then he tells him, for it will lead, and the benefits of wisdom is that it leads to a life that will, you'll find healing for your flesh. In the same way that you go to a physician or a doctor to get medication for your body, Solomon is saying, son, you need to go to the wisdom literature and get wisdom as medication for your soul. But as he talks about the eyes, as he talks about the ears, as he talks about the feet later, the key that connects everything together is verse 23 when he talks about the heart. He says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Some translations say guard your heart, protect your heart with all vigilance. The, new, the NIV says above all else, above all else, keep your heart, for from it flows the wellspring of life. The heart in the Bible is not just the beating organ in your chest. It's the control center of your life. It is the center of your mind, your will, your emotions. It's the seat of your passions. It's your inner self. It's, it's who you are. It, it, it's not just how you feel, what you think, or what you do. It's, the comb it's everything. If you go to your favorite fast food restaurant, you have the option of getting just the fries, just the drink, or just the burger. Or you can get the combo meal when everything comes together. Your heart is the combo meal of your life. It is the center of all of who you are. He says, if that's true, which it is, guard it, protect it, care for it. With all vigilance, he says, guard your heart. It's the center of who you are, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible is, really has a way of like wanting us to take really um, care and specificity and understanding how our heart is doing. It doesn't ask this exact same question, but it warns us over and over again from having a hard heart, having a bitter heart, having a cold heart, having an unclean heart, having a prideful heart. In verse 21, the heart takes a passive role. He says, my son, store my words in your heart. The heart there is viewed as a bank vault. If you want to keep it tight, you want to keep it secure, and there's two things that are important with the vault. It's all about who, what deposits you're making in that bad boy and who got access to it. Later in verse 23, though, when he says, guard your heart with all vigilance now, the heart's not taking a passive role, 
where it's just receiving and storing, now it's taking an active role. So it's not looked at as a vault, now it's looked at as an engine. It's what catalyzes you, it's what drives you. Your heart drives what you think, it drives what you feel, it drives your emotions, it drives the people you talk to, it drives the people you relate to, it drives the people you don't relate to. It's driving who you are and what you're doing. And so he says, son, listen up, pay attention, above all. We, in Proverbs, he talks about everything under the sun. Our church is in a series on Proverbs right now that I call the master class in life because he's giving a master class in health and finances and relationships and family and your mind and recreation and everything and sloth and laziness and hard work, everything. And yet he says here, your heart is, is as important as anything else because everything flows from it. Charles Bridges notes how important this is when he says, as Satan keeps special watch here, so we must keep special watch as well. If the citadel is taken, the whole town must surrender. If the heart is captured, the whole man, affections, desires, motives, pursuits, will be handed over. Now, why would Solomon tell his son, Hey, son, I need you to listen up. This is so important. Do it with all vigilance. It, it requires attention. It requires your focus. It requires your energy. You can't just be falling asleep at the wheel. Guarding your heart isn't something you can put on autopilot. It's probably because he understands his son is living in the same world that he is in the same world you and I are in. A world where there is a 24-7 barrage and a bombardment on your heart. Your heart is constantly being attacked. Your heart is constantly being tempted. Your heart is constantly being tried. Your heart is constantly being tested. And the question you have to ask yourself is, who or what is invading and infiltrating your heart? Because whoever has access to it will determine how you move, how you think, what you do. Many of us know what happens when we give our hearts over to people who don't have our best interests in mind obvious place where this comes to mind is in relationships, particularly dating relationships. When you give your heart over to somebody who's not ready for it, when you give your heart over to somebody you think you're going to care for, but instead of um, honoring it, they beat it and trample over it, that leaves you feeling robbed of joy, love, and ultimately it leaves you with a broken heart. It's funny, in the Song of Solomon, same author Solomon, there's one thing that occurs three times. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 8, verse 4, he says the same thing three times. He says, uh, do not awaken love before it pleases. Every parent loves telling that to their teenager. Why? Because the idea there is, hey, um, Song of Solomon is a book that's emphasizing and celebrating the consummation of marital love, and yet in there over and over and over again, it says, hey, listen up. Don't awaken, in other words, um, you better guard and protect your heart because if you give it over to someone, and in that context, it's talking about romantic, romantic love, but if you give it over to somebody that's not ready for it, and they trample it, instead of caring for it, protecting it, cherishing it, honoring it, it'll leave you brokenhearted. How is your heart? Are you protecting it? Are you, and this, it's, and it's not just relationships, it's everything. What you think, what you read. What, this is why parents are so vigilant with who their friends, who their kids are friends with, what they're watching, what they're reading, what they're investigating. Because they understand a, a child often doesn't know that, oh, my, my heart is just open to everything. So a parent has to come along and say, no, 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 I, I don't want that in your heart. Because if that gets in your heart, you'll become somebody that I didn't raise you to be. How are you guarding your heart? How are you protecting your heart? Is it something that you're doing? Solomon would tell us, it should be a top priority in our lives. He says, guard it with all vigilance. Throughout the Old Testament, God had a way of telling his people that when they turned their backs from him, when they rebelled, he would use this phrase, you've turned, your hearts are far from me. Basically, the children of Israel, he's telling them, y'all haven't been protecting your heart. So they would, and, and the crazy thing is, he, he makes the connection, he says, the things that you give your heart over to that's what you become. The things that you love, that's what you end up looking like and living like. So he would say things like, oh, you all, you built that calf, you built that idol. And then he would say, I, I love how sometimes God tries to flex in the Old Testament by telling his people that the idols that they're worshiping aren't really idols. So he'll say things like, they got ears, but they can't hear. They got eyes, but they can't see. It, it has weight to it, 
but it has no power. The idol has feet, but it can't move. And then he says, y'all just like that. You got eyes, but you can't see me. You got ears, but you don't hear my voice anymore. You got feet, but you're not following after me anymore. And the result is you're going in a direction that I never led you to. Because where your heart is, the trajectory of your heart will determine, the treasure of your heart rather determines the trajectory of your life. Or to put it another way, the things that you desire is what you become. Martin Luther says it like this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is your real God. Mm. That's, a hard, I, I, that's a hard one. I, read, I, read, I, put, I picked the quote. I, I knew it was in here. I read it this morning and I still was like, Lord have mercy. Whatever your heart clings to, the things that your heart gravitates towards, that it bear hugs, that it can't let go of, that's really what you worship. That's really what you love. The New Testament, Jesus says it like this, and he shows the relationship between the heart and your life on the negative side. He says in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Did you see what Jesus just did there? He basically summed up the remaining passage here in Proverbs 4. Look at, let me remind you of Proverbs 4, 24. He says, put away crooked speech from far from you and devious talk from you. So what is that? That means a messed up heart leads to a messed up mouth. Verse 26 and 27, ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the left or to the right. Turn your feet away from evil. A heart that loves evil will lead to a life that does evil. Jesus, he, Jesus says the same thing. He says, out of your heart comes evil thoughts, what you think. Murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, what you do. False witness, slander, what you say. The Pharisees were, they cared a lot about the externals and how people looked on the outside. Just like, man, forget that. I see what's on the inside of you. And what's on the inside of you will always come out. It will always come out. The great Bible teacher Warren Wisby says, if we pollute that wellspring, talking about the heart, the infection will spread before long. Hidden parts, hidden appetites will become open sins and public shame. Most people think that beating habits, bad habits, and it will really, most people think that life change occurs at the level of, you know, fixing my habits. And so I need more discipline, I need more, you know, routine and that kind of stuff. If you've ever battled with addiction or known anybody who has, then you know that it doesn't matter how many passwords has been changed, how many locks have been changed, what restrictions have been taken away. Um, it doesn't matter all the things that are changed on the surface. Those things are important and they need to happen. But if there is nothing fundamentally that has changed at the, with what they desire, then they will get whatever they want to get. I've had so many, I, I can't tell you how many people I've had looked at me and said, man, I, man, I, I changed the passwords. I got accountability. I'm doing all these things. But I want it and I can still get after it. Because like the song by Galena, uh, Selena Gomez says, the heart wants what it wants. The, the heart wants what it wants. The key to life change doesn't occur at the roof of habits. It occurs at the basement of desire. The things that you, what, you have to talk about, what, are you, what do you really desire above all else? If you think that I just have to change my habits, change my routine, change my rhythms, That'll help for a little while, but you'll always, the gravitational pull of your life will always pull you back to the thing that you love the most. That's why St. Augustine says, the key to life change is not the acts of the will, but the loves of the heart. That change doesn't happen just because you willpower. So I was having lunch with a guy at our church a long time ago. Uh, we were having coffee and we were having lunch at Chick-fil-A and he was like, man, I, you know, I've been drowning under the weight of pornography. I don't know what to do. So number one, you're doing a great thing because you're bringing it down to the light. James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another so that you can be healed. I said, the second thing you got to do, and this may seem weird, you got to tell God you love doing it. He looked at me like I was crazy. I said, no, 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 no. He's, like, you've already told me that you got, everybody has your passwords, you got all the accountability, and then you still feel bad after all the things happen that you don't want to happen. I said, I, I said, the issue isn't your willpower, your desire. 
The issue is you need a consistent pattern of talking to God and praying, saying, Lord, I love this. I love this more than you. It, ha it has nothing to do with my mind. <laughs> a friend of mine always told me, I know if you knew better, you do better. But bro, I was like, bro, I know better and I still don't do better because it's not about what I know. It's about what I love. And so you got to say, Lord, I love this. I need a greater love to capture and to submerge my heart so that I can see this as a lesser love than what it really is. Because if I don't, then I'll keep on saying, God, I love you in my head. But if I'm in a, if I'm in a battle royale and I I got brain, intellect, willpower on this side, looking like Hulk Hogan. Then I got the heart looking on this side, looking like a squirrel. I'm picking the heart every day of the week. Doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter round one, round two, round, I know, knock out the desire of that heart will overcome the mind, the will, it will overcome everything because what you desire and what you love the most will shape what you become. It'll shape what you do. Have you ever wondered and, and, you know, it's crazy reading this passage. The Lord's been humbling me. I, if you're like me, or maybe you're just better than me, I often wonder, how can really smart people do really dumb things? How, inside the church, outside, it don't even matter. I, you're like, man, you, gotta, you have more money than you know what to do with. You have more notoriety than you know what to do with. You have more fame than you know what to do with. Why would you make that decision and risk it all? And then the older I'm getting, I'm like, oh, I don't even, I don't even judge no more. I'm like, dog, I get it. You, you're brilliant, you're smart, you got six degrees. You know, you know, if somebody would have told you, if I make this one decision, it'll destroy my family, ruin my reputation, it'll strain my relationship with my kids, of course you would say, why would I do that? I know better than that. But when you're in the situation, it's not about, oh, I know better, it's about what does my heart want? And if you're not fighting for your heart and you're just walking all willy-nilly and loosey-goosey like, oh, you know, I'm pretty smart, like I've memorized the Old Testament, I don't care what you've memorized. I care what's dominating your heart, what is captivating your affections. So he says, guard your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the wellsprings of life, meaning what you love and what you desire will lead to what you become. In other words, if um, fear is what's inside your heart, it'll result in a life that always plays it safe, and it'll definitely mess up your walk with God because fear can't dominate your heart while you're also trying to live a life of walking by faith. If anger is what's dominated, if anger has permanent residence in your heart, it'll show up in your life. You'll pop off and attack everybody everywhere all the time, whether it's justified or not. Perfect example, Genesis chapter four, God comes to Cain. Cain is mad, he's big mad. It says he's very mad, actually, which that's the, when the Bible says somebody is very mad, that's the way of saying they're hot. As a result of God not regarding his sacrifice and regarding his brother, uh, something crazy happens. He starts boiling on the inside. The Bible says he's angry. He's very angry. God comes to him, and he says in verse 5, he says, excuse me, verse 6, he says, Cain, why are you angry? Y'all, that, that right there is a description of grace. The inside of you is fuming, ready to erupt like a volcano. And God comes to you before you make a decision that will screw up your life. And he says, why are you angry? That's God's way of saying, Cain, how's your heart? What's going on on the inside there, brother? And if you think, well, I don't really think that's a hard question. Later in verse 7, he says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. Cain What's your enemy, if you're not careful, if you don't guard, protect your heart, your enemy will be your enemy. The rest of the story, you know, Cain is like, man, I ain't trying to hear that. So Cain kills his brother. Question that I've been asking that I still don't know the answer to. So we got a you know, room full of scholars in here, so some of y'all may have to help me afterwards. Cain, how did you know what murder was? Unless I missed something, we hadn't seen that yet. So Genesis 3, sin corrupted, infected, affected everything, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship with the ground. So yeah, the big theological answer is, yeah, sin destroyed everything in the chapter before. That, I got that. But you've never seen murder before. So you're telling me that what's going on on the inside has got so much power, so much desire, so much strength, so much energy that it causes you to do it. It says, I, got, I can't stay in here. I got to get out. So the, the desire of your heart, whether good or bad, it comes out and it takes, he says, my heart wants to snuff out your heart. 
And that's exactly what he does. If you're not careful about guarding or protecting your heart, it'll have you doing things you never thought you would ever do. And it'll turn you into somebody you never thought you would be. How's your heart? Are you guarding it? Are you protecting it? If greed is what's in your heart, it will dictate every single decision you make. You will live life close-fisted instead of open-handed. Everything will be a cost-benefit analysis. Generosity will be something that you can, it's elusive, it's like, it's like trying to catch the air, you're trying to catch, but you can never get it. In this book, um, Psychology of Money, Morgan Hassel, he talks about a young man grew up in the streets of Calcutta, grew up orphaned as a teenager, went to Ivy League school, excelled above and beyond his wildest imagination. By the age of 40, he was the CEO of a major consulting firm. He retired short after that, sat on numerous boards. He retired to work on, with the UN and the Economic Forum. Then he was sitting on a lot of boards with Bill Gates and a lot of large publicly traded companies. Then something interesting happened. He retired, but Morgan talks about in his book that uh, this man, the desire of his heart, it was for more. Not less, more. Really, he wanted to be a billionaire, and so he, at that time, he had a net worth of about 100 million, which, you know, God, you, you throw that my way, say less, I'm good. <laughs> and yet, he wanted more. 2009, he's sitting on the board of a large investment bank. The bank finds out that Warren Buffett's gonna invest billions of dollars in order to keep it afloat. 16 seconds later, homie picks up the phone, steps out the meeting, picks up the phone and calls his hedge fund manager friend and tells him what just happened, hangs up, and then apparently he wasn't a fan of listening to 2 Chainz music, because if he was, then he would have known the feds are watching. They called him, he goes to prison, loses his reputation, ruins his money, him and, of course, <laughs> the guy who made a killing off of that deal, bought 175,000 shares in that company. And you would say, man, why would you do that? That's, you came, you started from the bottom. You grew up in the streets of Calcutta. You were orphaned as a teenager. You went to Ivy League schools. You, you made a, you were seen in your industry as the best of the best. You were rocking on boards with Bill Gates. You, you already had a hundred million and some of you are like, man, I, if I had that, I would be content. If you ain't content with what you have now, you can't look at him sideways. And the reality is, you're like, would you have made that? If you would have asked him, do you know what you're doing is illegal, would you, a 16-second phone call that would put you into jail and ruin your reputation in your industry and the money that you spend your life trying to accumulate, don't you know? Of course you know better. The battle was not at the height of the mind. It was at the war of the desire and at the heart. It was at the war of the heart. That understanding, it's easy to look at people like, man, how could you do something like that? What that does and what Proverbs is telling us here, it makes us all look in the mirror and say, Lord, what's in my heart? Do I have a prideful heart or a humble heart? Do I have a heart that looks after you? I remember the great theologian John Piper here, he's well known, probably his best-selling book is Desiring God. And I was like, I'm not, it's not hitting me. It, good book, love it. So, <laughs> you know, this, don't come for me, please. I'm a big fan. Love you, John. However, the book that resonated with me the most was When I Don't Desire God. Because I, I remember, I saw that title, I said, oh yeah. Like, the high food and theological stuff and desiring God, I need that and, I, and that's good, but my heart's, my issue is I don't want God and I know I need him and so I need him to take me to where he needs, where he wants me to be so that I can desire him. This is why the story of the gospel is so important. And in Christian, it's so beautiful. The, the gospel basically says nobody heart, nobody's heart desires God. So God has to prove his love. He has to display what it looks like to have a heart that seeks and wants him. I love the way that Chelsea prayed for uh, Josiah this morning. She, she said at the, end of her, at the end of the prayer, she said, Lord, may he always choose you. I said, I was about, I said, mm. Because I know that, that's, that's my prayer for myself. Because I, every day, I don't make choices that say, I choose God. But the gospel reminds me, God has already made a choice in Christ Jesus when he says, I chose you. 
That's, that's why we're gathering. Where are people to say, Lord, I don't always protect my heart well. I don't always guard my heart well. I don't always care for it. I don't always keep it with all vigilance. But I am so grateful that I have a Savior who knew that I would never pursue him, who knew that my heart would never be captivated by him. So I had to see his heart decimated in order to draw me near to him. One of the things I love about the Apostle Peter as we wrap up, he says something really interesting. He says, Lord, I'm never going to turn my back on you. Jesus says, all right, we'll see. Jesus is being hung up, and then some of the townspeople are like, hey, what? ain't that your boy over there? He said, no, nah, I don't know. Come back. Another group of people, hey, hey, not a, you, you got the accent, you look like him. That's your rabbi. No, nah, I don't know. Okay. Over there by the fire, they're like, man, listen, we've been watching you for a good 30 minutes. Like, I know, I know I've seen you. you, you one of his guys. And now he starts getting, no, no, I don't know him. Jesus dies, resurrects. One of the <laughs> most beautiful things, when the women come to the tomb and see where he's at, he tells them, hey, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. But then he says, tell my disciples and Peter. If Genesis 4 is a beautiful picture of grace, that's a beautiful picture of double grace. Because if I'm Peter, I'm thinking, I've already denied him three times. What was in my heart was the fear of man, the approval of others. Like, I've been rolling with Jesus for three years. I've been doing, he, I walked on water until I drowned, but then he caught me. Like, I've seen him do everything. And then when push came to shove, when I had to publicly uh, profess my allegiance and my association with him, I denounced him. I said, no, nah, I don't know to do. And now he's died, he's resurrected, or so I've heard. And then the women come back. And if they would have said, hey, the, the Messiah, he is risen. He wants his disciples to come. If I'm Peter, I'm thinking, I know he ain't talking about me. Because the last time I was asked about him, I denied him. Jesus meets him and he says, hey, Peter, uh, do you love me? He says, you know I love you. He says, feed my lambs. Hey, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Tend my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. Now, everybody, obviously, the connection between the three denials and three times that Jesus asked the question, but I don't want you to get focused on the quantity of the question, but the content of the question. Peter, last time I saw you, or last time you saw me, what was in your heart was the approval of man. But I'm here to tell you that my grace is greater than the fear in your heart and my love and my mercy is still welcoming you to come to me. Do you love me? Do you, that, that's what grace is. Grace says, your heart wants nothing to do with me. It denies me, it doesn't want to associate with me, but I want everything to do with you. Come, embrace, give yourself, humble yourself, guard it, protect it, stay in prayer, gather with the saints, Read the word. Do, be, be on guard to guard the thing that matters the most. The things in our lives that we care for the most, we protect it. We, we make sure that nothing gets near it. View your heart like that. A man was telling his friend, he said, hey, I think I'm ready to settle down. I think I want to get married. His friend said, boy, stop. No, you don't. He said, his friend said, you don't want to settle down and get married because you love living your bachelor lifestyle. You love coming and going as you please. You love traveling 300 out of the 365 days of the year. Who wants to, have, who wants to willingly marry a part-time husband? And then he thought to himself, he said, yeah, you're right. I, I really don't want to get, I, I like the idea of getting married, but my life shows that I really love the life I'm living. And so, you know, even though all his friends are getting married, he's like, you know, I, I love my life. I, can, I love coming to the wedding and then leaving. I love coming to the baby shower and then leaving. I love coming and going. He's on his way to the airport and he's getting ready to um, hop out the Uber. He bumps into a young lady, knocks her bag down, and he's, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. He picks it up and he looks at her. Then his heart says, hello. And, and he's, he's giving her the bag. And then he, he, courage just overwhelms his heart. He says, hey, um, would you want to get coffee? right now? To his surprise, she says, yes. I would 
And they're having this conversation, and she's talking about how much she loves the city and how she's like, you know, I love traveling on vacation occasionally, but I really love this city. And he says, oh, I love this city too. I want to stay here forever. Now, he makes a decision later to take a demotion instead of the promotion he was offered so that he can work in the city. And you're like, what happened? What just, tra- you, were the, you were the guy that, yeah, you wanted to get married, but you didn't really want to, you really loved the life you were living. You know what happened. He got captivated by a greater love. He got captivated by a greater desire. And in an instant, everything changed because the treasure of your heart will determine the trajectory of your life. Father, we thank you. May we be a people that remain on guard. May we keep our heart with all vigilance. Help us to do that. God, we have a heart that by default wants to stray, wants to wander, wants to run. Would you pull us back? Would you draw in your grace? Like you did with Cain, would you say, John, why are you angry? In the same way you said, hey, tell my disciples to come in, Peter. You're telling us, come. You know, you by name specifically, you come. But Lord, my heart wandered, come. Lord, may we be a people who live our lives always on guard, protecting, cultivating, caring, so we can see what matters the most, flourish the most. We ask and pray this in Christ's name, amen.